the Musashi Field Manual. Explore your mind using the 21 guided principles from the mind of the world's greatest swordsman. Get it today at stickmanpublications.com. Welcome to the Martial Arts and Life Podcast with Chris Wilder. Hi, I'm Chris Wilder. Welcome to Martial Arts and Life, and I'm glad you're with us. That's not the way to do kata. That's not correct. You shouldn't move that way. These are interesting statements that are made in respect to one person teaching another person a form. It really doesn't make any difference what that form is. It could be Wing Chun Silim Dao. It could be Shotokan's Teki. It could be any kata, any pattern. It doesn't make any difference whether it's Kung Fu or whether it's Karate or Pinchak Salad or, or anything. It's a pattern. It's a tool to convey information. One of the things that I think is really fascinating, and I want to drill down into it, is the goal of the kata. I'm going to talk about kata because that's what I'm familiar with, but you certainly can extrapolate this out to anything that's taught in a pattern form in martial arts. And you can even push it out into uh, other endeavors, both mental and physical. But we're going to stay with the kata topic. I'll let you push it out into your world as you see fit. The challenge becomes, am I learning this kata because I want it correct? Am I making an effort to do what's supposed to be done in a way that answers the question about purity? I've spoken of it before, but I remember years ago being at a uh, seminar in Sarasota, Florida, and this guy came up and asked me what I did, and I said it was Goju-ru Karate. He said, yeah, that's what, what uh, our club does, who you with, and we start going through that whole thing. And he gets to the point to where he says, well, we do our kata just the way Chojun Miyagi did it before he died which I thought was really an interesting statement because I would submit that it's absolutely impossible to do that. It can't be done. You cannot have information conveyed like that and have it be specific. You can get the general points, you can get the trajectory, but the first thing to go are the edges of the conversation, the edges of the idea. And you can look at almost any oral tradition in passing on of mythologies, and uh, the stories change, but the core of the story remains the same. You can look at Greek mythology, it'll be that the story says that one demigod sprouted from the belly, wholly formed of this uh, god or titan, or a little later in the story, or another version of it, it might be that they were born. Well, you get the idea. It's a general area, you know, the belly, the reproductive organs. You can see how the edges are the things that change. And so, when this guy's telling me that he's doing his karate purely, eh, it's, uh, you know, I, I smile. I smile and nod. That also bleeds into the idea of correctness. What is correctness? Is it that I am preserving this uh, form perfectly? Which, if you are, that's fantastic. Nothing wrong with that. It serves a purpose. Or are you adapting it to your physicality and brain type. That is also valid. You know, then it goes into, is it authentic? Well, who's going to tell you it's authentic? Somebody's going to argue with you about its authenticity. You can find that person quite easily. There's this thing I uh, called the uh, Twitterverse or 
Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or uh, Odd Infinitum. You get the idea. There's always somebody who's going to look at that and go, yeah, I see what you're doing, but no, and here's why. Okay, great. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to transfer knowledge. And that knowledge is dependent on where you see it from. If you see it from a health and uh, longevity situation, then, of course, your form takes on a different quality. I always get a kick out of the um, Tai Chi. It's really great for your health and mobility. and joy. Yeah, well, you run into a practitioner that knows how to use Tai Chi. You got yourself a serious situation. But we don't hear that about karate or judo. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, this, oh, it's great for mobility. And it, you know, and you don't see very often a judoka going to a senior center to teach judo throws done from a chair. Just, it's not there. So Tai Chi has sort of expanded into that area and has you know, taking it over and everybody's like, oh yeah, Tai Chi, yeah, that's really good for your joints. It's really good for move. You know, okay, great. Please do that. But understand that there's an underlying set of principles here that make this a truly powerful martial art. And there's a lot of practitioners out there that can take you through that, take you to it and bring out that aspect. So they're not mutually exclusive, but it is what you choose to focus on. So it's the same thing with a um, karate kata. Am I focusing on the purity of it? Am I trying to build a museum showpiece? Or am I interested in the correctness? Or uh, do I want to get validation for my great kata? Or am I trying to be authentic? Is it accurate, true? All of these questions start to really bubble up. And it depends on where you view it from. The other night, my wife and I stopped into a uh, fish and chips joint, and uh, we were just grabbing a basket of fish and chips. And as we're sitting there waiting for our order to be brought out, uh, my wife says, that song that's playing on the uh, speakers there, that's their greatest song ever. And I listened for a minute, and I went, yeah, uh, the Sound of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel, yeah, that is their greatest song. You know, there's other songs that they have, but man, the the words are just just beautiful poetry, and they really elicit a response. And then you throw the vocals on top of it with the harmonies, and that yeah, that is a song that that if you just take a moment and give it an opportunity, it will take you away. Simon and Garfunkel released The Sound of Silence in 1964, and in the spring of 1965, the remix was climbing the charts. This is kind of a funny little thing, is that it was released in 1964, and it was getting no traction. So without talking to Paul Simon or Art Garfunkel, the label went in and remixed the song, uh, added some orchestration, and changed it. A year later, it was number one on the charts, the Billboard Hot 100. It was number one. And it was constantly battling with a Beatles song as to who was number one that week. In 1999, Broadcast Music Inc., now this is a licensing company, so if you use a song... You know, you pay royalties, rightfully so. These people created the songs, beautiful work. They should be paid for it. And that's what the Broadcast Music Inc. does. It's a licensing agency. They listed The Sound of Silence as the 18th most performed song of the 20th century. That is huge for two guys singing some beautiful harmony. In 2015, 51 years later, the heavy metal band Disturbed 
covered the sound of silence. Now, they didn't turn it into a, a barking dog or a screamathon or uh, emo or any of that kind of stuff. They really did uh, a fantastic job with it. Loudwire, an American online magazine that does hard rock and heavy metal, that kind of stuff, they listed Disturb's cover of Sound of Silence as one of the 20 best rock songs and one of the 10 best videos that year of 2015. That's awesome. And I suggest that if you have the opportunity to go on the web and listen to the original Art Garfunkel and Paul Simon 1965 release of Sound of Silence, it's really beautiful. And then I'd like you to take a moment and listen to the 2015 Disturbed version. It's really good. The words are the same. The notes played are in the same pattern. They remain the same. These two songs, they convey, they transfer information and the same experience. Are there some things that are different? Absolutely. The 2015 Disturbed version, it's an octave lower. Is that wrong? Well, if the lead singer of Disturbed had tried to reach Art Garfunkel's high notes when Art Garfunkel was in his 20s in 1964, with that youthful voice, he wouldn't have made it. He wouldn't have been able to get to those notes because everybody's voice drops as they become older. They lose the high end, the ability to make those high notes. Could they have auto-tuned it, which is that program that allows you to bring a note back on key? And we've all heard it. It's that robot. When it's, when it's really overdriven, it turns into that robotic sort of sound for the singer. Rappers use it a lot. We would have mocked the band Disturbed. We would have said, that that's, that's cheating. That's not cool. That's wrong. If they went ahead and sang the song as Art Garfunkel and Paul Simon did in 1964, they wouldn't have been able to get a quality product. And we would have mocked them for that. So knowing their own place in life and understanding their abilities and their capabilities, they went ahead and they dropped it an octave lower. And nobody said anything. Except, that's one of the 20 best rock songs. Hard rock songs of 2015. In fact, that's one of the 10 best videos, too. The songs are similar but they're different. They convey the same information. They do it in the same pattern, but it has a different quality. And that's what kata is. I've spoken about it before, and I am really not a fan of the one-inch sensei. Here's the one-inch sensei. You're doing your punches or whatever it might be, but let's just say it's punches. And since it comes walking along and takes your hand and lifts it up one inch and goes, that's where the punch belongs. Well, I'm punching arbitrarily into the air. Is it possible that my imagination had set my imaginary opponent to be a little taller than me or a little shorter? Is it possible that I was training something else? Is it possible that my focus was in a different place? But no, I'm one inch off. I need to move that. Not a fan of that, because that's missing the big point. Is that punch strong? Is the structure correct? Is the intensity? Is the speed? These things are what are important. So if we go back to these two songs, or this one song, with its two versions. If Disturbed had tried to do what 
Simon and Garfunkel did in 1964, they would have failed. But they recognized the principles and the beauty of the song, and they said, we're going to make that our own. That's the way I believe kata should be done. In every instance, I think that you should honor the notes, the structure and the information, how it's being conveyed, the pattern, the breaks, the insertions, the deletions, the additions. And yet, you should make it your own. We allow this in music. Not a question. Oh, hey, look, somebody covered. Hey, let's check it out. Oh, Metallica covered uh, Whiskey in a Jar. Great, let's go hear it. Oh, I kind of like the Thin Lizzy version better, but it's not bad. Oh, you mean that drinking song? Yeah, it's a great little song. And it gets pushed forward in different versions and in different ways. Kata should be the same. Adhere to the principles and the rules. Don't break those. But understand that you may be in a different place in life. Your physicality may be different. And you need to express your art in a different manner. Possibly 25 years ago, maybe even longer, I was at an uh, international martial arts tournament. There were people from all over uh, who'd flown in, I mean, from Europe and Asia. And so we're watching this kata competition. And uh, this woman got out there. I don't remember exactly where she was from. She might have been from Japan. She might have been from Korea. I, I don't recall exactly. But her kata was absolutely stunning. And everybody applauded. And I turned to him and I said, that's the way I want to be able to do kata. I was excited. It was like, I'm inspired by her. I want to do kata like that. And he said, you can't. Oh, wait, what do you mean I can't? I think I can do pretty much anything if I set my body to it. And he goes, no, you can't. That's a 115-pound, 19-year-old uh, Asian woman. And you're absolutely the opposite of that. Your karate looks different. Wow, yeah, you're right. Doesn't mean it can't be good. Doesn't mean that it can't be Disturbed's version of The Sound of Silence. And it doesn't mean that it's anything other than a really good expression of some really good ideas and information that stood the test of time. So as you sort this, I want you to recall the story of these two songs. I want you to think about other songs that you have heard covers of and realize that in some instances, the covers have actually been more popular than the original. The book, The Way of Kata, dive deeper into your art own it today at Amazon.com. And now it's time for a little section called We're All In This Together. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into this section. I'm going to use the term my student, and I'm only using that to replace the person's name because this is really kind of a private matter, but the story is so profound, so moving, that you need to hear it. So, although I'm using the term my student, it in no way makes this experience subservient or that I had any part to do with it other than it's been related to me. Maybe it's a little awkward, but I think it's the best way to solve the situation and to make sure that you get the value of this story and get a chance to hear it and enjoy it. So with that, let's get started. You ever had a brush with a celebrity? And, you know, they can turn out good, they can turn out bad. People say, don't ever meet your heroes, don't want to meet celebrities. And 
the fact of the matter is, is that celebrities are just like anybody else. They can be good folks. They can be bad folks. Talent doesn't necessarily equate to um, moral gravity or to how they hold themselves in the community. People can be bad and snotty and rude, or they can be gracious and wonderful. And celebrity or a position of power is no guarantee of either. I've got a student of mine that had a brush with celebrity. At least I say celebrity because I watched this guy referee boxing and was really impressed by him. His name was Mills Lane. And Mills Lane grew up in Georgia, moved to uh, Reno, uh, Nevada, of course, which, you know, when you think about boxing, that's that's uh, kind of where you'd go. After a little stint in the Marines, that's where he wound up. He was a boxer, but he also became the chief deputy sheriff in Washoe County in Nevada in 1979. And then became a um, district attorney and subsequently a district judge in 1990. And this is where a student of mine and Mills Lane cross. Mills Lane, the boxing referee, uh, the television career, you know, his court show. um, This is where they cross. My student had a really rough childhood. We've talked about it. I mean, will willingly he's given up some information. I mean, he's, he's healthy and fine now, but man, the stories of neglect and verbal, mental and physical abuse, um, the reform schools that he was in through no fault of his own you know, wound up in those because he was not wanted during the summers and things were concocted and he fell into traps. And you just, you know, it is a hot steaming pile of causality and just, you know what I'm talking about. Well, he wound up in court in Washoe County, Nevada, in his early teens. And the judge who happened to be Mills Lane, who I just described to you, said, you know what? He said this from the bench. Um, my my student, was. He, he said I was standing there, and he looked from the bench, and he said, you know what? You don't need to go to juvenile. You need something else. Here's an address. You be there tomorrow at 8 a.m. If you fail to show up, I will issue a bench warrant for your arrest. Well, my student shows up at 8 a.m. at this nondescript building, and uh, he said, Mills Lane comes walking up, keys the door, and he said, the next thing I know is I am in a boxing gym. And for the next couple of years, that's what he did. He came and boxed and was taught by Mills Lane. And he talks about how Mills Lane made this profound change in his life, teaching him the sweet science, giving him an opportunity to find himself, lose his aggression burn it off, and also to challenge himself. Powerful ingredients to building a good man. So Mills Lane, when he had the opportunity and he saw a spark, was able to say, this is what you're going to do now. You have a choice. And my student stepped into that choice. And his life 
is profoundly different than what it could have been. The trajectory that he had was, well, I don't need to spell it out for you. You know where it was going. But it got changed because a celebrity intervened, jumped in, saw the spark, and made a difference. That's a powerful, powerful legacy that uh, Mills Lane is leaving. He's 81 now, and he's had a stroke. He's not at the top of his game right now. But the legacy that he leaves and the quality of people that he has helped find their way and now are out in the community pushing forward the senses of responsibility, ownership, accountability. Yeah, Mills Lane, big legacy. And there's a little story about how celebrity and a troubled kid intersected and did so in just the most positive way that could have possibly worked for that young man that day. I'm Chris Wilder. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Martial Arts and Life. And as always, I look forward to your comments. I've been getting a few more lately. And thank you. I appreciate the compliments. I appreciate that you are finding value in the podcast and that it's actually reaching and it's, it's landing. And that, that, that's the biggest thing that could possibly happen. So thank you to those of you that have uh, decided to reach out, drop me a line, and you can do that at Chris Wilder at chriswilder.com. That's K-R-I-S-W-I-L-D-E-R at chriswilder.com. Uh, I'm not asking you to do it. If you're compelled to do it, yeah, drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. But I do enjoy this, and I'm glad that you enjoy it, and I'm glad that you're finding some value too. Until next time, take care. Be well.